Hi guys, it is a hot, sticky, early March night here in the collapse of global industrial civilization down here in Austin, Texas. And this is Sam Mitchell of Collapse Chronicles, where this week I have the great, long overdue pleasure of talking to Karen Schrog. I have uh, read a couple of Karen's essays recently here on the program, and we're going to dig a little deeper into Karen's life and work here this uh, for the next hour or so, and we're going to go up to Chile, Minnesota tonight. And if you are not familiar with Karen, here's just a quick bio from her excellent website called Moving Upstream. Karen is a lifelong environmentalist, naturalist, educator, poet, author, and overpopulation activist. She began her career as a naturalist in 1993 as the director of the city of Richfield's Wood Lake Nature Center in 1991. She is passionate about the role nature centers can make in keeping communities thriving. She is a former public and private school teacher and received two degrees from University of Minnesota and her doctorate from the University of St. Thomas. And for what we're going to be talking about mostly as a member of the advisory board of the nonprofit group World Population Balance. <clears throat> She has become deeply alarmed by the lack of discourse surrounding the overpopulation crisis. In 2015, her book, Move Upstream, A Call for Overpopulation, was published by Free Thought House Press. She writes articles, lectures about her book, and this long-ignored topic to a wide variety of groups, and we are thrilled to have Karen on the show to talk to us about this long-ignored topic on Collapse Chronicles. So Karen Schrag, come on and say hi to the folks, and we're going to get right into this. Well, first of all, I'm jealous that you're warm, because uh, I haven't seen my legs since uh, last October, so <laughs> it's... Uh... It's cold up here, and although I have to say it's getting warmer this weekend, but uh, so nice to meet you. Hopefully it'll be in person sometime. Yeah, we will have to make that happen. So, uh, guys, one thing I purposefully left out of uh, that this intro is that Karen is also a poet. Uh, she has two books of poetry, The Wolf Within Poems to Awaken and Inspire in Times Like These, and Organic Dreams and Pickled Nightmares, a pocket full of political poems for the resistance. So, so Karen has picked out one of her poems to uh, lead off this conversation, and we're going to see where it goes from here. So Karen, come on and share one of your poems with us. Oh, thank you so much. This one is from Organic Dreams and Pickled Nightmares. It's called Echo Chamber. Nothing is sustainable. Not anymore. Not with billions of us in the hamster wheel of rep repetitive consumption. Not my solar panels. Not my cloth bags. Not my pretense of a plant-based diet or my efforts to buy all things used. You see, with every meal purchased, with every hot shower taken, no matter how short, we are consuming more than the earth can handle on its most productive day. Because the echo chamber is too loud, billions repeat my actions, while thousands more are added daily to the ticking of a clock of extinction. There you go. Wow. Okay. Well, we can wrap up this conversation. <laughs> that was that, that, that was a uh, a, a heavy-hitting uh, poem. So tell us a little bit about the history of, of how that came to you, which I, I'm assuming uh, that that embodies a, a lifetime of work. So just give us some history of how you came up with that. 
Well, I get tired of the um, what the environmental movement did to the whole idea of consumption and overpopulation. They kind of left off the overpopulation and just focused on consumption. And we got kept getting the messages that said, well, you know, you just have to take a shorter shower or whiz in the shower, as some people would say, and, and everything will be fine. Or you just have to wash out that mayonnaise jar and that peanut butter jar and everything will be fine. And I wrote that echo chamber to me was, I don't think people really have a really good grasp. I know I don't of what really a billion people it is in, in quantity and how no matter how, you know, if you could knock on the door, I don't know how big your neighborhood is, but let's say on, I live in a cul-de-sac and if I could knock on everybody's door and say, could you please take a shorter shower? And even if they would listen to me, how, what would that accomplish when we keep growing by a million people a week globally, when we grow, um, I think our uh, contribution of that is several hundred a week. I mean, those new consumers all need, we're apex predators. We need basics, and those basics can't be provided for when we've added five and a half billion people to the planet in the last 90 or so years. And so it was this frustration of saying, yeah, overpopulation and consumption aren't two different things, they're one and the same because we're apex predators, where we are in the food web or the food pyramid, however you wanna uh, metaphorically look at it, we're on top. And the top, just like owls in the wilderness, should be the least, not the most amount. So we flipped the food web on its head and that is the fallout is everything we're feeling um, and doing. And I noticed some of the comments on, on your page, people like to say, well, it's not overpopulation, it's this. It's certainly many other things as well. But the reason I focus on overpopulation is it's been ignored for so long. It's been the, the stepchild, if you will, of the environmental movement. And I just wanted to get it back into the discourse. So uh, my the point I always make when I when I engage with guests or or commentators on my channel is someone who is never born who is never born has an environmental footprint of exactly zero 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 exactly uh, you, you know that that's this is not that hard to grasp obviously. Uh, we 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 can all cut back, but uh, but but as as you say, your frustration, and, and I know I have felt it. You know, I went without driving a car for six and a half years. Six wow. and a half years, and I said, okay, so I'm going to stop driving a car. So you know, uh, so everyone else is going to you know one of those things. And uh, and I know exactly what you mean about your the, the frustration. Uh, in the six and a half years that that one uh, overpopulation activist in Austin, Texas, stopped driving a car, there were probably thirty million cars added to the the, the streets of of the planet, and 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 I just said to hell with it, and just bought me another car, and so yeah, I mean what. Address that for a minute for people like me who, who like you, are frustrated by our individual and consumer actions when we sit here and try to do something on an individual level then look around at 230,000 people hitting this planet every day of the year. How, how well, do you handle your frustration with that? Well, you know, it's a dance. It's a dance. I think you have to behave in a way which makes yourself feel um, proud and worthy of being a, 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 a being on the planet within reason. And for example, um, I try to visit my dad every day. I have to drive a car to get there. I can spend my time feeling guilty about the carbon or I can say there's a greater good that I'm doing. Um, so every action you take, I think has to be weighed in a, in a, in a, not just in the context of your personal life, but also in the context of where we are on the planet right now. If you think 
you're not driving a car or whatever it is, is going to make a huge difference, you're probably just mistaken in an overpopulated and growing world. So you have to navigate for yourself personally what feels right to you, but not do it in an arrogant way, in a judgmental way to say to someone, I can't believe you're driving a car. Well, even if that person stopped driving a car, it really, really wouldn't make that big of a difference. But in general, we have to come to a a much bigger decision. And the irony of overpopulation is that the issue itself makes individual agency worth less. And so you know, it's, a, it's a navigation. It's not an easy answer. But for me, the answer is context. And, you know, it's like you're, you're trying really hard not to pollute. Meanwhile, uh, some, some chemical company is dumping uh, millions of gallons into, you know, the Louisiana Harbor. And you're just going, wait a minute. But I, I made sure I recycled my motor oil. You know what I'm saying? It's, yeah, it's just, yeah. just, it's just, uh, uh, I think you have to understand context. And I think the environmental movement back in the 70s was to blame because I remember the slogan. It says, when one finger points at somebody else, three fingers point back at you. So they really put the burden on the individual choices where as the world has become more industrialized and more uh, multinational in its corporate, we have had less and less choices I mean, I know of someone who's very, very liberal, but he's very, very uh, disabled, handicapped, can't get out of the house and and must use uh, delivery services, which I know are and he knows are bad for the environment. But we get less and less choice in the world we have on the individual. And we also aren't using government regulations. We don't have a tightly regulated capitalist system. We have a, a renegade one. And so why do we blame the individual for buying the packaged organic uh, apples? Why don't we blame the company for how they ship it to us? Do you know what I mean? So it, I think we need to shift a lot of the blame onto the system rather than the individual so that we can make more progress and so that we can understand how how little our voices are, but how big they can be if we do what we're, you and I are doing right now, having the conversation. Yeah, just just having the conversation in, in the year 2020. It's, uh, as, as you've mentioned in some of your, your, your other YouTube videos, I think you're talking about how Paul Ehrlich, he was the very first guest I ever had on Collapse Chronicles. Was, he was my number one uh, lead-off uh, interview on this channel. That you mentioned, Johnny Carson had Paul Ehrlich on his show 19 times, but you're still waiting for your the, the call from Bill Mayer uh, yes, to right. come on his show. Uh, yes, right. I love Bill. I, I think he's terrific. Um, I, I He's the conscious of this culture, and I would love to not just myself go on, but several of us have a whole show on, yeah. on this, this issue, which I think he cares about deeply, but... You know, it, it. other things keep getting precedent and we keep getting shoved in the background, under the carpet, you know, kicked down the road and it never gets better by doing that. It's it's the one issue which gets conceivably worse by not addressing it. Yeah, and, and uh, it's a, just unbelievable how despised, uh, how, how despised the O word is. I mean, it is, it, it just continues to floor me. Karen, how uh, that it, it is probably the most loaded term out there. It's the the biggest sacred cow. That if, when you bring up that O word, I mean, it's just unbelievable what it stirs up. Everything you know from charges, of course, that you're a eugenicist, which people have no idea what the word eugenics means. Obviously, you, you know, you you've gotten the charge as well as I have. And right. other and other guests I've, I've I've interviewed, and so how are we going to bring this conversation to a a, a wider cultural audience? I mean, how do we do we get out of this box that that somehow that people interested in this subject and can see the light? What's the way out? 
I guess my approach is to help people understand that the opposite of what they think is true. As a naturalist, I've been dealing with myths my whole career. You know, bats are going to fly into your hair. Nope. Um, you know, all the myths of, of nature that people um, uh, believe. And the opposite of our population is true. So I think one of the ways is we need to start calling ourselves scholars instead of activists or advocates. And the reason I say that is because the minute I say, and I, I might change this on my website, that I'm an activist, it, it's a charged word. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to call myself a scholar. I would call you, you're a, a scholar to me isn't someone necessarily with a doctorate like I happen to have, but it's someone who spend, you know, at least 10,000 hours, which is Malcolm Gladwell's in, in his book, The Tipping Point. That's his kind of marker for, for an expert on something. And we're scholars on this because we're deeply concerned in a compassionate way of what's happening to the life-giving forces of this planet and all the species. That's why we're here. If we weren't, if we didn't care, we would just go play golf, play tennis, play pickleball and, and not worry. Um, but we're here because we care. To, to not care is to not do anything about this issue because it's going off the cliff by itself. So I think we have to be brave enough to say the truth and often enough. And what I, why I frame it as a scholarly issue, because what I'm going to ask people to do is, did you read, read three or four articles, read three or four books, and then let's have a conversation. If you're going to critique me on a level of, I have an opinion, well, we're not on the same table. I have a friend who says only adults get to come to the table. And I think that that's where the conversation needs to happen. I'm not going to dismiss that the issue in the past isn't mired in some real trouble. Uh, but I just know that the trouble in the future is far greater. And that's what I'm trying to prevent. So I try to show that my interest in this is from a compassionate standpoint. And if you want to meet me at the table, I'll bring my own chair. So that's where I think we need to create that. I think we need to stop calling her. I'm not an advocate for anything other than a livable planet. And we can't have a livable planet if we continue to assume that humans don't have to obey the laws of physics like every other animal does. So we have to be able to challenge, and I do challenge people and their stories because their stories, if they're not sustainable, then we're not on the same playing field. So I want people to understand that you have to bring evidence with you when we have this conversation. You can't just have an opinion without evidence. And we kind of live in that world right now, don't we? Well, we have evidence that you can fit everybody on this planet into the state of Texas. Right. Well, that's but that's very easy. <laughs> that's to the just, one I hear all the time living in Texas. Yeah. Like we can fit eight million people right here in Texas. And, and, and are people that stupid, Karen? I, I, I guess they are because well, no, I think I, more I, people I, cop that argument than cop ours. They do not understand the the uh, the the most fundamental concept of the ecological footprint and how many acres of land it takes to support one human. You well, know. that's correct. And 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 I, I'm cautious with the word stupid because if you asked me anything about the game of hockey, Ignorant. I'd be very stupid. I would not know how it was played. Um, what I, I think the challenge immediately when someone says that, I would say that's absolutely true. You could take and put people side by side, <laughs> eight billion of us, and put them in the state of Texas. We'd all and starve then, to death within then, a week. And then a week, <laughs> week from now, I want you to tell me how that feels, or maybe a day <laughs> from now, or ten minutes. So I'll expect accept the premise of that. The word "fit" is the key yeah, verb. Yeah. We could fit. I mean, I could fit. A thousand mice into my cupboard. I don't want them there, and they're not going to live there, and they're going to all die there. But I certainly could fit them all in my cupboard. So, what's your point? Your point: they could fit in 
that is that is an irrelevant point and it's true for its face value of just an actual physical thing but if you think you want to have a thousand mice in your cupboard you know go ahead but we want to not fit into texas we want to thrive in yeah, the world yeah yeah and you're not th- so i think we can not be um we, we we can hit these arguments head on with so much evidence and so many um um truthfulness you know people you know I, I i've actually been in china and i've been speaking on this issue in china and of course that comes up in almost all of my talks and i say how come you never talk about um the two things that are part of chinese culture one is that um there there's a lot of 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 difference of community and individual rights are very different in that culture um the dowry system really devalues um having a a female child because the dowry system means that you're going to have to pay for that daughter when she gets married i mean there's just things are more complex than people they want to throw darts at you and i'm going to say you know that dart has to come with a lot more education than you're throwing at it and again go back do your homework and then let's have a conversation because these are hard conversations to have but i just won't accept people coming at me with very thin arguments. Well, sometimes you just get the feeling, sometimes, Carrie, like I do, that apparently there are a lot of people, if not the majority, just think the highest and best use of a planet is to figure out how we can cram the most people onto it. I, 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 just, I, I just don't understand their defense of... Uh, uh, of it. That that seems to be the only thing that I can come up with, is that that's what they think is the highest and best use of a planet. When well, I'm talking to these people or listening to these idiots on, on other YouTube channels. Well, you know, I, I take it back to our monotheistic um, cultures, whether we are religious currently as adults or not. I would guess that most all of your listeners and, and I were raised in a monotheistic religion, which put humans in the center of the universe. And so it's really not their fault that they believe that anything pro-human equals good. And if you look at indigenous, this is something actually studied in my doctorate, um, and, and it was fascinating to me that an indigenous perspective in general puts humans in the web of life and as dependent on life. And, and you, if, if you hunt, you, you thank the animal you hunted so that you could live understanding that we depend on animals animals don't depend on us if you look at monotheistic religions as humans being created on the last day um in a god-like image you get this elevated notion from when you're a tiny kid that we are it and everything else serves us so i really can't blame the the culture for doing that when that's how you're raised from where it's really hard to shed that um that whole idea that that we are the center of the universe because we've been told that since we were little kids and our culture tells us every single day um i i defy people to look around in their own cities and see things that aren't devoted to the betterment of humans whether it's an office building or a hospital or every square a, a bike trail it's all for humans and the um the gobbling up of the planet by the humans is is from that original story of we're we're not just the best but we're it we are the epitome of all creation and so to get away from that we have to be brave enough and courageous enough to dismantle that narrative okay so even you know, even in this rabbit hole, the the collapsitarian rabbit hole or, or the doomosphere, whatever word, cute little term you want to use for it, I notice that even people who get it are 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 still framing this whole thing from a humanist approach. That that it still. The, the the conversation, even when the conversation is about collapse, it's still 
seems to be weighted towards humans and 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 not every other single species of earthling humans share the planet with combined so your own passion where where do you think uh it it sounds to be like i, I mean i'm i'm going to guess here that that your passion derives more from our fellow earthlings is uh, is that a fair uh assessment or would you like well, to Correct yeah, I, I'm as a picture. I think you picked to show me. Uh, you know, I, I do spend a lot of time in oceans, and uh, not enough. But um, every time I go and put my head in the water in a in a beautiful coral reef, I, I look and I see this balance. I see this these incredible creatures who've been here for millions and millions of years, all working within their ecosystem and within the laws of physics. And I, I get my head out of water and I and I look at us and I see a species living far out of our uh, ability to sustain this bipedal hominid that we are. And I feel it's just so unfair and so immoral to to harm their environment, the, the, the ocean environment, the forest environment, because they're living in a, in a balanced way. I mean, I don't know if you know much about what owls like barn owls do or, 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 or many owl species, but if, if they, I was just uh, looking at um, a nature video about uh, snowy owls and how if the lemming population uh, goes down, they just don't lay any eggs. And I'm going, oh, my goodness, and we're the smartest species on the planet? <laughs> they just know yeah. how not to reproduce because they can assess how the lemmings are doing, which are going to feed their family. Mm -hmm. And, and so I have just this incredible respect for the species on which not only I depend, but we descend from. Now that goes against a lot of people's story. I mean, even if you can show the DNA and how we're just a few genes away from being, you know, bonobo chimps, (laughs) people just don't like hearing that. Um, I had kids uh, when I worked at the nature center and I would, you know, tell them that they had a choice. They could be minerals or plants or animals. And the kids looked at me and they, we're not animals, we're humans. Now, these are little kids. Yeah. They already had, they already drank that Kool-Aid. Yeah. So really a, a complete, and it's actually, I'm writing a new book and I'm talking about the different narratives that have to be turned on their heads in order for us to, to really address problems at their source, which is is my whole move upstream concept. But I think that that is really why. And it, it doesn't mean you forgive. I don't like the word forgive. It's kind of a, a religious term. But I, I think you can understand at a deeper level why people are so anthropocentric. But but, but I, I, you make it clear from the record that you are not a, a misanthrope. By by any means, I mean, you, do you still? Where this will be kind of our segue into this into this next discussion, but you still identify yourself as, or, or do you, or do you not identify yourself as a social justice warrior? I identify myself as an Earth citizen. There you go. And to be an Earth citizen. I need to be compassionate within the laws of ecology. And so I think it's really, I I feel like I've gone from, if if you want to use gymnastics terms, I feel like I'm gone from, you know, the, the, what do they call it? The, the, the horse, which is about, oh, I don't know, maybe a foot wide to now I'm on a balance beam. So that's very hard to stay on those four inches of balance beam to be a good earth citizen and do it in a compassionate way. But I think that should be the goal. And I I think that um, there is an an, an interesting irony that I believe, which is to be too pro-human is to be anti-human. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So uh, it's just like all of these, I I, I hear, although I I question, there's a rumor out there that Ted Kaczynski wrote a paper recently from uh, 
from prison. I, I, I have you read this thing about the people on the ship? No, I have not. That, that Ted, uh, that Ted read. I, I personally don't think Ted Kaczynski wrote it. But anyway, it, it, it's basically what it is: is all these people on the uh, on the ship uh, that's going down together, and we, and it's the various. Uh, the, 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 you know, I, I can't remember the different characters. I'm sure there's a gay character, a black character. A and and but but it's all of these different characters. They're going down on the ship together, but they're still having this conversation about you know something smaller. Or are, are, are you following? I, I I know the point. Whoever really wrote this was making that we have all of these very important conversations going on on this planet. That, that we need to be having, but if you're not having them in the context that we're all going down uh, on the Titanic together while we're over here arguing uh, whatever the whatever it is, uh, it, it, it's not going to mean anything if, if, if we all go, if the ship goes down. Uh, right. Do you know? I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I think I see that that kind of reflected in your work, uh, that message. Talk about well, that for a minute. It's the, it's the, well, it's, it's the move upstream message. It's like saying, if you could, you know, if I could give you, Sam, a, a magic wand and, and, and I could, you could eliminate all nuclear weapons on the planet, they're, they're now gone. If you could um, get rid of all... Uh, the, those kinds of problems. The, the, the question remains: Are we okay now? Yeah. And yeah. the answer is we're not. And and so why not work on the problem that is 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 the most existential threat, which is the fact that we are behaving as if we're not species that need to have a sustainable planet to support us, and that is a fundamental rethinking of our relationship to this planet. Um, there, there's a film that uh, came out uh, in Traverse City, Michigan, um, and is going to also be shown um, in in uh, April, I believe, uh, and, and it's called Planet of the Humans, and it's um, oh, really? by Jeff Gibbs, and it really addresses this whole idea of the fact that we are blind to what we are doing to ourselves in the way we are are taking on this planet as our sort of our our food trough you know it's it's really um a hard it's a hard uh vision to change and and people like Jeff and, and some others who are, are working so hard on this, I think are doing a good job of bringing the visualization into it. Eight Billion Angels is 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 out um, with uh, Terry Spar's yeah, efforts. I, I interviewed Terry about that movie. Of yeah, Terry's Growth out Busters. there. Growth Busters happen with Dave yeah, Gardner. I've interviewed, I've interviewed Dave, yeah. of course. And, and, and I know all these wonderful people who are work years and years and years trying to make these artistic meaningful films and i think collectively we are trying to push this this uh, this this big huge boulder down the hill and 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 let people see the truth so i i i'm very i'm very lucky to have these people in my life and in my work uh, that i do uh, they're they're so talented and so and so gifted in the work that they do, um, and I think we need multimedia. We need a lot of voices, and we need to work together to create the messages that are um, going to work. I've been working on a uh, a deeper message for my my new book, and it's going to be called "Where Do Old Stories Go to Die." And it's really about this whole idea of nar- the basic narrative on which by which we live. You probably don't realize it, and other people don't realize it who are upstream thinkers. 
But along the way, you have shed old narratives that you were raised with. I know I have. Um, but I, I really wanted to look at overpopulation by what actually keeps it supported and how it's actually suppressing the Earth's ability to um, be, be a sustaining life support system. So I came up with this idea of an iron stool with four legs on it. And if you can imagine, it's a, it's a, and this will be in detail in my book, but, but just to give you a preview, um, the, the seat itself is overpopulation. And the four legs are fossil fuel-based neocapitalism, reduced mortality, and increased longevity, total fertility rate, and immigration migration policy. So those four things are a part of what keeps overpopulation thriving on this planet. And I believe a comprehensive look at all those will help address it, not one piece at a time. We tend to want the silver bullet that's just going to solve everything. And the more and more I get into environmental things, I realize that there's just there's many problems and many solutions that we need to look at and not keep thinking, oh, as soon as we get rid of plastic straws, we're done. You know what I mean? That yeah. whole idea of one thing is going to solve everything. It's, oh, it's all about capitalism or it's all about immigration. or it's all, No, it's not. It's, it's all of it. And that is kind of my approach. It's overwhelming, but no other answer seems to work because once you've solved one thing or think you have, another thing crops up. It's like whack-a-mole. Yeah, so I want to, uh, good Lord, there's so many, uh, so many places that, that, that I want to take this conversation, and we are already 36 minutes into it. But oh I, I was on your blog uh, a, couple of day, a couple of days ago, and, and I, I just read your two most recent essays, which I want to touch on if we have time in a minute. But this one was from uh, right at a year ago. It was on the subject of inertia. And down in it, you uh, it was actually, I guess you, this was written, uh, well, I guess this was on the heels of the IPCC report and, and all these other, you're, you're, that, that you're hearing more and more of this about the seismic shift on how we're going to uh, turn this freight train around. And what you did, you broke it down into seven ingredients, the ingredients for a seismic shift on entrenched problems need more than information. I propose uh, that the recipe for radical social change has to include at least the following, and I'm going down these. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend the time here. You can find this on her blog and her uh, about inertia. But I, I, I want to move down to number five. Uh, number five of seven. Uh, one of your ingredients for a seismic shift is a way out direction offered to change behavior that is acceptable to most and doable by enough people to make enough of a difference. And this is where the, the rub comes in. Uh, okay. is, is that going to happen, Karen? Well, you know, I, I think that if I lived in the land of probability, I'd probably just take up knitting. But... Uh, <laughs> But I, I, what I, what I meant by that is, is are you familiar with the Heath brothers? They wrote um, a book called Make It Stick. I am not familiar with the Heath brothers. Educate us. Okay. Well, the, their their book. Um, I, I like to read a lot of um, social science stuff to try to figure out this 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 species called humans. And they wrote about um, the elephant and 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 the rider. And the elephant is our emotions, and the rider is our brain. And what they said was, you can't just excite the elephant, because it'll run around in, the, in a circle, and it'll break things, and it'll trip. The rider is our intelligence, and the intelligence has to direct the emotions. 
and they give many examples. I, I really invite you to read the, read the book. It's a, it's a good, it's a good sort of metaphor for, for example, they say, you can say, yes, I want a woman president, but you go into the voting booth and your elephant takes over and, yeah. and you can't. Okay. So the, so the way out is you can't just excite the elephant. You can't just say, we're overpopulated. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. Because people will go out and just have more kids because they just want to deny what you're saying. The way out is an example is the um, the uh, one child one planet campaign that World Population Balance is directing right now, uh, and asking for funding if I can give them a commercial. The um, so the way out is this is a way out. This is a po- up. Uh, this is a choice you can make. We can we can do this. Um, other organizations um, talk about how we can get our immigration numbers back to what where they were in the 1920s. Uh, Garrett Hardin was talking about this um, in 1989, saying, "Look, we are reducing our fertility weight, but if we keep our immigration numbers high, and 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 I know you want to address this, but basically um, talks about how." There, there, we have to address things locally because that's where our jurisdiction is and that's the power we have. We Very few issues are actually truly global. They may be worldwide, but they're not global. Global are atmospheric conditions and ocean conditions. But, but potholes, Garrett Hardin says, are local. You, you don't need a global pothole policy. You need a local policy. So the way out that I'm talking about is a. you got to give people – the possibility you have you can't say the room is dark you have to say here's a flashlight and there is a way out but you have to follow the flashlight so i that that's what i'm meaning and it's more theoretical but but you have to start just like in physics or anything else you have to start with a theory before you hang on the practical uh uh solutions to it which i think groups like world population balance are doing a very good job of um they're trying to say look um fertility um which isn't again that's one leg of the of the stool but it's an important leg and um here's what we can do about fertility now a lot of people come back and say oh what about social security and what about our economic system well that also has to change but it's much easier even though it's very difficult to change an economic system than it is to change the fact that we just ran out of fresh water, <laughs> you know, I mean, so, yeah. so, you know, I think those of us who are ecology based, I don't think I'm smart enough to call myself an ecologist, but I think I'm ecology based enough to know what's more important and where our emphasis needs to be. That's what I mean by that way out direction. But are, are, are we going to be able, in, 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 in the time that we, time frame we have to work with, and time is getting short, I think you and I can both agree, are we going to just get through to enough people, or, or are we not? I mean, what is, what is your level of optimism that this, this great awakening and seeing the light is, is going to happen in time? Well, I don't accept the premise of optimism or pessimism, and I'll tell you why. Um, I come from a, a very deeply Jewish background where my uh, ancestors went through the pogroms in, in Russia, and um, and I know that that if they hadn't if they had been optimistic, they would be dead and I wouldn't be here. Um, they were pessimistic and they did something about it. They got out. And so I, I never really um, looked at optimism and pessimism as necessarily. A, I, I don't try to put things in a linear way. I try to put them in a third dimensional way. And I look at life in a third dimensional way. I don't accept left and right and moderate. I accept the third dimension is to, you know, you get out in nature and you realize that life really happens in that third dimension. We, we, we look at screens all day long and we get the delusion that it's two dimensional. So I operate from the perspective of what needs to be done, the voice that I can lend to what needs to be done. And I let go of, will it be done? Yeah. Because if I live there, it would just be hide the razor blade time. <laughs> so you are not a doomer. 
I am not a what? A doomer. Well, I, I know some, and I just haven't really been envious of, of their uh, persona. I don't think that attracts people to our issue. Um, we certainly have enough evidence that things are not going well or won't go well and they won't be done in time. And I, I don't disagree on an intellectual level with people who um, are doom and gloom. I just want you to show me evidence that that's going to make it better. And if it doesn't make it better, then I'm not interested. So I, I don't disagree. Again, that's the writer in me. Yeah, you're right. It's probably not going to happen. But where am I going to live every day that I wake up? I'm going to live in the possibility, not in the probability, if that makes any sense to you. Okay, I like, I, I, I like that answer. So I, I, anyway, uh, we're, we're, we're going to have to poke a couple of rattlesnakes in this. Sure, sure. Uh, the I word, immigration. Uh, uh, I enjoyed read. I enjoyed reading your essay, and and I'm going. I, I I do not. I I I do not bring guests on this show as much as people would like me to to debate them. Uh, but y you seem like a woman who who can handle handle this. This is just a question. Sure. Uh, the, 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 when I read the immigration arguments about that we need, uh, like specifically here in the U.S., since we're we're both Americans, and I, on one hand, I agree with everything that you said in your essay uh, about uh, about limiting uh, immigration. Uh, it makes perfect sense. Here is where that I and, and, and a few other people uh, balk just a little bit at this. While I 100% agree with the, the different points, is my point, and, 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 and people I think agree with me, is that, that, that the national borders are, are just kind of, they're kind of imaginary. And it doesn't matter which side of some imaginary line a a person is living their their environmental footprint is their environmental footprint whether they stay on that side of the line or, or come over to this side of the line they've been born and you see what i'm saying and, and so if you look at I it from an a global you. perspective so what is your answer to people like me when they bring I, this up i i See, see the, 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 the vision that you're looking at is a vision that um, someone who is in, a, in, in the space shuttle looking down at planet Earth, what do they see? They see no borders. They see one planet with a lot of problems. Yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's, that's what you're saying. The reason immigration is, a, is one of the, that's the legs of the stool that I'm talking about is because the jurisdiction we have to make changes is country by country, county by county, locale by locale. And so if you want to make a difference, if you want to make a change, if you want to do something, you must do it within your governmental structure. Um, I would like to save the cassowary. The cassowary is a bird that lives in Australia. I didn't get to see it. I was there for three weeks looking. I got to see wombats and kangaroos and so on. But from my place in Minnesota, other than sending a check to an Australia sustainable party or something, I really can't do much here to save the cassowary bird. I can work on the loon because they actually live yeah. here. And so... When it comes to immigration, um, you have to understand that there's been some good research by uh, some colleagues of mine who have said that when you bring an immigrant into your country, um, into the U.S., depending on where they come from, but on average, their carbon footprint goes up fourfold. So it does. it's not an equal sum game to say, oh, they're on the planet. If you bring someone in from the Dominican Republic or from Nigeria or from Sudan or from Somalia and you bring them into the United States, they're suddenly going to have a, 
a microwave and a and a car yeah, and yeah, a, and you know, yeah. so you're increasing their carbon footprint. So I, my my answer to you is, although I understand on a very deep level that yes, we are just one planet. The way we deal with population, as as Garrett Hardin said, was um, you know there is no global population problem. There's just a problem with 180 countries, however many countries were were in the world at the time he said that. Um, and and he also said, never globalize a problem if it can be solved locally. And that's in an article that he wrote back in July of 1989 for The Humanist. I would really invite, it's a wonderful article. I really invite your readers to, to become really familiar with that um that article that he wrote, because that's kind of what I'm what I'm talking about is that how we deal with problems. Uh, he, he basically talks about potholes and says it's we don't have a global problem of potholes. We have a local problem, although I bet they have problems with potholes in Iceland, too. Maybe we can share our solutions, um, but we're going to solve them locally. And that's where this argument stays. It's we must solve our population problems locally for, for a couple of reasons. One is that's just our reach. We, we, I can't go, I cannot go to Malawi or to Namibia. I cannot go to Ghana and, and, and be as effective with their policies. I'm not from their culture. I'm not from their religions as I can be here. So it's, it's an efficiency thing, but it's also about how, we are culturally sensitive, although there are some really great groups that are doing some amazingly culturally responsible things. Um, Population Media Center is one of them. If you haven't had uh, Bill on your show, he'd be a great person to have on. He's done just amazing things in, in countries where they use radio programs and television yeah. programs to try to get people to lower their birth control rates. But I'm just going to invite you to look at this from a how do we handle it as locally as possible. Um, I think we can have global conversations. That's really important. I've been to England talking about this. I've been to Belize talking about this. I've been to China talking about this. And the conversations are really important to have. But I've always tried to be respectful that they really need to deal with it through their government agencies. If we had a a United Nations that had some sort of a jurisdiction over us. Nobody wants that, it seems. We all we could maybe do that at that level, but we're not going to solve this by ignoring that um, you're going to always see a migration from uh, poor countries into richer countries, and that's going to uh, be problematic because carbon footprint will go up and so on. Am I am I making sense? Yeah, my uh, at, at the risk of. Uh... I don't know if I've ever said this aloud on, on, on this particular. Ch- I, I I have other. Uh, I, I need to be. Re- I, I I have other personalities here in the Doomosphere, but on this show, my I think this might be the first time I've said it. My immigration policy is: I think every time somebody crosses a border. I don't care which way, if they're going from uh, from third world to first world or first world to third world. Anytime you cross the border, you get sterilized. That simple. Well, Vasectomies to yeah. the right, tubal ligations to the left. We're going to welcome you in. That's the first stop you make here. You get yourself sterilized. Come on in. Buy your microwave. Uh, are you ready to adopt the Sam Mitchell uh, immigration policy or not? Well, you know, I think that 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 that, that you're making me laugh, but it 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 really gets at at that whole personal freedom stuff. We you know we have this Jeffersonian personal freedom uh, meme in our which is this, uh, you know this I have a right to I have a right I have a right, and you know it it that's where um, the rubber meets the road as far as you know we we say to what if you say to a a, a woman who's just made a decision not to have a child or maybe to have one child. And it's a really heartfelt climate change inspired, they're calling it now climate anxiety decision. And someone moves in next door who legally, our legal migration is allowed 1.1 million, which is, as I mentioned in my, my, my blog, is, is you know sixfold more than it was in the 1920s, which is crazy. Anyway, they move next door with their four or five kids. How does that feel? 
when you've made the personal sacrifice and yeah. someone who is, has probably had much more personal anxiety than climate anxiety, climate anxiety is kind of a, a, a weird luxury. You know, it doesn't feel like a luxury, but if you're worried about the climate, you probably have enough food to eat right now. You probably have a roof over your head. You probably aren't being persecuted because you're a minority in a country. So, so I'm not, it's not a blame game. It's just a, a description here that, that the idea that says you, we have criteria for how you can live in our country and that will include how many kids you can have, I don't think you're far off at all about what needs to happen. But, it, it you know, think of the cultural barriers are in front of that. Oh, it, it'll, it'll never happen. I'm, I'm, I'm not joking, but obviously I am. Yeah. Okay, well, well, Karen, I really wanted to uh, get into... Uh, why environmental moderates are more frustrating than outright climate deniers, where you say environmental moderates are, are our greatest stumbling block to doing right by the earth. But we're 56 minutes into this, so we're going to have to come back uh, when you get your next book published, and we're going to pick up with why environmental moderates are the greatest stumbling block to doing right by the earth. But right now, guys, as much as I could go on for another hour, we're going to let, uh, in, instead of my usual closing, uh, where I'm going to ask Karen to give her 60-second message to humanity, Karen Schrag, close us out of this interview with another one of your poems, and then we will reluctantly have to say goodbye. Well, I am reluctant. I could go got for a couple three and more a half hours. minutes before we <laughs> collapse. So, give a close with another poem here. All right, it's called Cosmic Convention. The planets got together and held the Earth's hand. I was always envious of you, said Jupiter. So many species and all that water. I only have cold clouds of gases and no one to build anything on me. Mercury chimed in, but now that one species you have that cuts down your trees and builds homes into your sky has gotten out of control. Venus echoed their thoughts. The last time we met you, you had much more ice, and now you're running a fever. You don't look so well. You used to have so many different forms of life, Neptune observed, swimming in your waters, flying in your skies running in your valleys, swinging from your trees. But you are so quiet now, except for the roar of the engines of that one species that never learned how to share. There you go. I think that is an appropriate uh, ending to this, uh, to this conversation. So folks, real quickly, if you want to find out more about Karen's work, movingupstream.com an excellent website. You can get all sorts of links to all sorts of other stuff that she's into. And stick around for when we wrap up here, Karen. But guys, as much as I hate to say this, I do not know where one hour has disappeared. It seems like I just sat down in this chair. But if you enjoyed what Karen had to share with us, please spend a few minutes thumbing this video up. If you did not enjoy what she had to say, well, thumb it down, and by all means, do subscribe to Collapse Chronicles when you're over here. And with that, uh, Karen Schrag, we really appreciate you taking an hour out of your schedule to come speak with us, and more importantly, keep up the good fight. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Bye, guys.